from ABC. This is the 10% Happier Podcast. I'm Dan Harris. We have a great guest this week. Uh, Rhonda McGee has uh, a very compelling personal story, and she's going to talk a lot about teaching uh, mindfulness to uh, what you might imagine would be a hostile audience of lawyers and also whether mindfulness can help um, uh, with uh, racism, something that she's experienced personally. So we'll get to Rhonda in, in a second. Um, uh, first, I just want to say that if you happen to be in uh, Austin for South by Southwest on March 12th, a couple of events you might want to attend. I'm going to be giving a talk in the morning. Uh, I think it's like 930 in the morning. And then we're going to do a live podcast from there at 330 Central Time. So uh, come say hi. But before we get to Rhonda, um, let's take a few questions. That's our new thing here on the show. Uh, question number one. Hi, Dan. My name is Andrea, and I am a high school teacher in Arkansas. And in light of all of the happenings in Florida with the shootings and seeing the way it's affected my kids in class, I feel like introducing some sort of coursework or curriculum on mindfulness and meditation and just coping with stress is needed now more than ever. And I was just wondering if you had some tips or if maybe you could bring someone on and interview them that has experience with introducing this kind of curriculum or coursework into a school setting. Thank you so much, Dan. Love the podcast. Thank you. Great question uh, and a really important question. I spent some time in Tallahassee not long ago with the survivors of the massacre in Parkland as they were uh, as these young people were lobbying other legislators to try to make some sort of change. And uh, obviously, there's just an enormous amount of uh, uh, trauma and fear right now among young people across the country based on these um, as, as a result of these ongoing School shootings, I've covered way too many of them personally. Um, and yeah, I do think that um, introducing mindfulness in schools uh, is a, it's a great idea. Um, there are sometimes issues around making sure parents aren't, you know, making sure parents are, are comfortable, that it's not a sectarian uh, enterprise. Those concerns have cropped up in a few places. Um, my view is that mindfulness taught correctly uh, is um, in, in a public school context is utterly uh, secular uh, and scientifically validated and, and there are lots of studies that suggest it can be uh, great for uh, on lots of levels for young people um, uh, to answer your practical question on two levels we actually have had some guests on who've talked about mindfulness for young people and uh, I recommend you listen to the podcast with uh, Susan Kaiser Greenland and Annika Harris which we posted a few weeks ago. But even more uh, specifically for you or anybody else out there who's looking to teach this in, in school, there's an organization called Mindful Schools. They're based out of San Francisco. You can look them up on the Internet. They're, as far as I can tell, great. I've met a bunch of their people. They seem great. And they're in the business of teaching teachers how to teach mindfulness to kids. Uh, okay, second question. Yeah, Dan, I just have one question for you. Instead of meditation, have you ever thought about prayer? Yeah. Look, I am personally not a believer, but I, I like to call myself a respectful agnostic. Uh, so I don't I, – I, it's not like I, I can tell uh, – I'm not hostile to religion in any way, um, except for people who do bad things in the name of religion, because um, I've seen – I've covered plenty of that um, – in my uh, in my time as a reporter, but that being said, uh, I th there are plenty of people who I know personally who integrate meditation into their prayer life, um, and that I've heard time and again that um, having meditation practice, which can turn down the volume on on random discursive thinking, can make your prayer life more robust, and yeah, you know, you're spending less time. Um, just caught up in your random habitual stories and you're more focused on the work you're trying to do in, in prayer. Um, so I think the two can work together uh, quite beautifully. But just for me personally, um, I uh, have not engaged in a lot of prayer because I think the prerequisite for that is that you have to have a firm conviction that there is a, well, maybe not the prerequisite, but um, I at least for as far as I know, I, I wouldn't call myself a uh, expert on prayer, but it seems like you would have to have a reasonably firm conviction that there is a a, uh, a God or a higher power of some sort. And, and I, like I said before, I'm more agnostic. I, I just don't know. Um, so 
I guess I'm just stuck with meditation. But I want to be clear that if you're a person who has a, a prayer life, that meditation by no, at least as far as I understand it, and you can talk to your pastor about it if you've got some uh, concerns, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I don't see any conflict there. We should say, um, I don't hear these questions in advance, so I'm just responding uh, off the cuff. And if you want to call, uh, the number is 646-883-8326. 646-883-8326. You can leave me a voicemail, and uh, it's entirely possible that we'll play it on the pod and that I will answer your questions. Okay, to our guest, Professor Rhonda McGee. She's a teacher of mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, specifically for lawyers and law students. Uh, but she's also got an interest in in how um, how meditation can play a role in the widespread problem of bias, of prejudice, of racism in, in our uh, in our country and in our culture. Uh, she is, just so you have it, a full-time faculty member at the University of San Francisco. She's been there since 1998. Her story of going to California as a young woman raised in the South it's very interesting. You'll hear her talk about that and much more. So here she is, Rhonda McGee. Here's what I always ask everybody. How did, how did you start meditating? Oh, great question. Um, so I can answer it from a more traditional place, which is uh, after law school and moving to San Francisco from Virginia um, way back in 1993. Um, you know, I finished studying for the bar and yet uh, had been really so focused on just the traditional, you know, success path. Um, I had been in uh, undergraduate school, did ROTC, gone to gra- uh, graduate school in sociology, then law, with really no break. And along the way, I'd learned all just, of the— Just because just I'm curious, where did you go—which schools? University of Virginia the entire time. Oh, the whole time. So, okay. tri- triple okay. Wahoo. Okay. Yeah, and, um, you know, had in that— over the course of that trajectory, learned a lot of really important um, skills. and um, But at the same time, I felt a real sense of the need for some grounding in something deeper than the kind of um, traditional way of processing and thinking through the world that I'd picked up in through, sociolo- through the sociological lens, but then through law, which was, again, such a profound training. But for me, there was just a way in which I was feeling a little bit disconnected from my inner self. And I knew that, you know, I I knew that to survive moving from the South to the West Coast from um, a family that had not been steeped in professionalism or higher education. Your your birth family, really? Yeah, my birth family into to this new world where I had these incredible opportunities and, and kind of a different set of networks. But you know, me, feeling a sense of groundedness in my own self was something that I was struggling with. And I just, you know, after passing or after studying for the bar and while waiting for the score, waiting for my first job, I discovered and started exploring on my own some ex- specific practices for managing the stress that I had accumulated over the course of all of that. And also just sort of um, resting in uh what I now see is awareness, but at the time, just like finding a way to relax, which mm-hmm. I was having trouble doing mm-hmm. after all of that. Um, so that's that that began the process by which I ended up some years after that finding uh, my kind of sort of main teacher in this you know meditation journey, who's been um, Norman Fisher, former abbot of the San Francisco Zen Center, uh, along the way. Uh, so I started studying with Norman around 2003 or four. Um, so that was quite a while after 1993 when you yeah, moved to the West. Yeah, yeah. I, b- between that, doing my own ex- various and sundry reading and practicing and, you know, um, but just more or less joined a sangha and, you know, started working with one teacher. Can you define sangha? For oh, me? sorry. So a sangha is just a practice community. It's just a, a Buddhist uh, term for a community in which you you sit together <clears throat> and you learn, um, you know, the kind of principles and, and um, practices that support deeper awareness and compassion. And um, there is a, a tradition of doing so in community um, that I that I personally found to be quite supportive of me, you know, me deepening my my 
you know, my own understanding of what I was doing, but also just, um, you know, there was some way in which I think part of my search was also not just for a sense of my own deeper self, but connectedness with other people. You you said you came from, I don't know anything about your family of origin. Mm-hmm. You said there were, that you were, uh, you seemed to indicate you were among the first, if not the first, to really go on to this level yeah, of higher education. Absolutely. Uh, what did they think about you joining a Buddhist group? <laughs> well, they thought it was a little weird. Uh, they thought, again, as you noted, I had actually started exploring, you know, various aspects of more Eastern religious practices way back in 93. And so, you know, talking about um, Eastern spirituality and practice as I was leading up to making, you know, deeper commitments and studying more deeply Buddhism and mindfulness, um, my family was just like, okay, well, we're from the South. And it was a Christian. We, I definitely grew up in a Christian family. And so they really... Uh, didn't didn't understand any of this, and actually thought I was probably you know going straight to hell, or <laughs> you know needed to be have that parade out of me. <laughs> so really, um, it was you know it's been a little bit of a its own journey to kind of find a way of um, you know being with this, which for me has just been tremendously liberating, um, and at the same time you know recognizing the extent to which it's it's quite different from the path that my own family was drawn to. I should say, actually, when I think about answering the question of how I come to meditation, I answered it from a kind of a more, you know, sort of, how did I come to the Buddhist meditation practices that I, you know, um, practice every day now and teach uh, to law students and and others, people interested in social justice, um, educators. Um, But actually, when I think about how I came to meditation, I always, I think of my grandmother who, Again, though she would never have called it meditation, and certainly uh, in no sense was she um, uh, Eastern influenced in terms of Buddhism or any of that. She was a a, a woman who had been born in 1906 in uh, the small town called a uh, region of the country, um, Lenore County, Kinston area, North Carolina, where I was actually born as well in 1967, some years after. But my grandmother had, by the time I was born, been called into the ministry on the one hand. So I would see her as a very little girl, having been born in that very segregated southern town. Um, we didn't have a lot of resources. My fam- my family, parents and mother, you know, mother and father were going through a difficult time. So I was finding myself spending more time at my grandmother's house. And I would, you know, regularly see her, see the light come on underneath the door of her bedroom before dawn. And in and I came to realize she was in that her room, g- having awakened uh, an hour maybe before everybody else, and spent that time in her own devotional centering practices. Again, hers were really Christian practices. But what I saw in that was this daily deep commitment to a, a kind of path for inner support that could support whatever one might do for the rest of the day. For her, she cleaned houses for other people during the week, and on the weekend she um, was the Reverend Nanny Sugg, so she supported community with sort of spiritual, again, Christian spiritual and religious practice. Um, But as a little girl, what I saw was there's a way to get in touch with who you are and what you're here to bring to the world, whether or not the rest of the world really understands it or values it, that fast forward to when I, you know, after graduating law school and moving to San Francisco, a part of me was aware that though I had had all these other advantages, there was something that was missing that my grandmother even had access Mm -hmm. to many, all those many years ago. So for me, finding meditation in a certain sense was like coming home, you know, it was very different, but it was also coming back to self in a way that was actually um, familiar to me and um, quite a solace mm. when I needed it. You don't have to answer this, but what was going on with your parents that, that oh. forced you to live with your grandma? Oh, yeah. No, they were just, you know, my my own father had been a Vietnam veteran and, uh, you know, um, had married my mother and quickly they'd had a few kids. I was in the middle um, and they were divorcing. And uh, it was a very difficult uh, family. You know, there were um, a lot of different types of dysfunctionalities 
that come from, I think, both, you know, the experience of having grown up in the quite still segregated South. My father was from Louisiana, and I've since come to know, um, and, and Mississippi, really, so uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, and different parts of Louisiana. Um, I've since come to know just what it was like for many black men during that era of deep, still segregation. He was escaping it in some ways by going into the military, but to go into Vietnam um, was also, it had its own, I think, scarring effects. So when he came back and rapidly got married and had children, it was just a very difficult time. He was drinking too much. The family was um, suffering from that. And my mother finally left. And it was in that period that we were staying, I was staying with my grandmother while they were getting, getting uh, divorced. And they finally did get divorced. And then I moved, uh, my mother remarried, we moved to Virginia. And that set me on the path to ending up going to the University of Virginia, ultimately, and in landing in San Francisco so many years later. Were you unique among your siblings in, in pursuing higher education? Or, or, or did they all do so? That's a good question, too. I was I had one sister outside of the what I call the litter of three. One sister who was 10 years older than I am, and she actually had gone to college. Um, and so when I was six or seven and she was 16, 17, I was watching the what first person in our immediate family to, to have you know set herself on a path to go to college. Um, so for me as a young girl, it's like, well, this is what we do then. This is, we go to college. I didn't realize that really she was one of the only people around me and um you know we were part of this first generation of four-year college grads and so my my bro- older brother and, and younger sister they had some college my brother had community college my younger sister didn't didn't quite finish uh for me education was uh was like clearly a respite from some of the chaos that we were experiencing at home mm. and i would say that in addition to having some, you know, I was identified as, you know, using the phrase gifted in some way through the programs and, and uh, that were in place at that time in public schools to identify such kids. But in addition, I had some personality, I think, some ways in which my personality was attuned to wanting to learn and um, being comfortable in school um, I say that because I know that there are many people who were similarly gifted, um, similarly talented, um, some in my family, some in my community, who just didn't also have the kind of personal capacities, the ability to sit and listen and do the things that you need to do in the school environment to succeed. For me, it was like, you know, coming home. And I just really, really felt safer in schools. And really felt like this was the one path out of the chaos that I was. Um, it's interesting because you, you describe school as a respite, <laughs> but um, and surely it was, but it also created all the stress that <laughs> when you arrived in California, you felt you needed some help from. That's true. Um, so you get to California in '93. There's a ten years of kind of looking around, yes, and then yes. and finally you end up with uh, Norman Fisher, who I have not had on the podcast, mm-hmm. but whose name I've heard many, many times, is mm-hmm. very well-respected yes. uh, teacher in the Zen tradition. You described earlier the practice as having been liberating for you. Mm. What do you mean by that? Because that's a word that gets thrown yeah. around. I, what, what, is, what do you actually mean by liberating? <laughs> well, well, you know, I mean, for me, it's um, it means... To be able at a moment, in any moment, to 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 have the the lived experience of of um, not being led around by stimuli outside of myself, not being pulled in the direction of the la- the latest thought, tweet or um, advertisement, um, email, right? To have some capacity to create a space between stimulus and response, you know, is one one way I think of freedom. So it's kind of a, like a cognitive behavioral freedom, like to know that I have choice in how I respond to the world. But within and around that, opening up around that, you know, in the world in which for people like me, you know, women, African-American as it happens, um, petite, um, you know, you realize, especially 
you know, coming into the world in this particular packaging from that particular community at that time, historically and culturally, um, and then going into higher education, military and law, uh, you realize these were not institutional spaces that were created for people like me or for people like me to thrive in. So, so from this, you know, out around and in, in with, you know, expanding around the experience of sort of cognitive freedom, liberation from the stimuli. For me, there's just been a kind of a grounding in my own being that also help, has helped me over the years uh, literally deal with the sense of, you know, just being um, an outsider in insider spaces. Um, so, so freedom means a lot, you know, many different things to me, um, but it's definitely about a kind of the, the lived experience of, of kind of being at the center of my own life. Instead of just yanked around by what other people think or what the latest marketing message is, et cetera, exactly. et cetera. Exactly. Do you, you t- so you just so talk about uh, higher education, law school, military, places where you often felt like an outsider. Mm-hmm. Outright overt racism or something more subtle than that? Or both? <clears throat> I mean, uh, mostly more subtle and not only racism, but sexism and the intersection of the two. You know, some classism thrown in there for yeah, good measure, sure. <laughs> as would be yeah, the yeah. case Lots in many of, of these places. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, more or less explicit, you know, more probably mostly subtle and implicit. Um, but every once in a while, uh, you know, explicit um racist, you know, statements and sexist, you know, kind of in the Me Too era. You yeah. know, we all yeah. have some stories yeah, right, that are associated right. with, uh, you know, explicit uh, harassment slash some version of assault or molestation um, in these spaces. And I have, you know, some of my own stories of that as well. So, again, it's, um, you know, a person like me, a, a brown petite woman going into those spaces, there can be many very subtle ways that I have been, um, you know, met with the experience of not being fully appreciated or fully uh, feeling fully safe. Um, and, you know, you never quite know experientially from this side, whether it's about race or gender or some combination or that I'm, you know, looked younger than I was or whatever it might be. Um, we can sort of create a narrative around what it was in pr- that particular instance. But, you know, um, all we know or our life would feel in those instances was, in some sense, discounted in, by degrees, disrespected, um, maybe even violated. So there were, you know, there was that range. I'll just give you one example from when I was in San Francisco during that first year as a lawyer. You know, coming out of my law firm, law office with my little law, my suit on that I would wear and my trench coat in San Francisco. Um, I just remember coming out of my office on Market Street near 4th um, and, you know, just having some uh, young white man walk right past me. Um, maybe he was in his 20s and he just said, you know, go home. And in I'm, San Francisco? mm I mean, in, not that that's cool anywhere, but I mean, you wouldn't think it would happen in San in Francisco. 19, by then, probably 1994, maybe 1995 or so. So that first year or two in practice there. Yeah. So and actually, that was the first time anybody had said that that close to me in my face. It was it was in San Francisco, California, not in, you know, Hampton, Virginia or Kinston, North Carolina. It was it was actually. In, yeah, I would have thought maybe maybe in the military. <laughs> well, in the military. I think it was actually more the gender, yeah, gender right, right. balance for yeah. me, you know. Um, mm, yeah, I think, uh, again, a combination. You never, again, you, it's hard to, one doesn't really, from this side, tease out, is it more race or is it more gender? But it, the particular ways in which I was sort of vulnerable, I think, were quite tied to my being a petite woman in that space. So you've now managed to combine all of these things, law, mm-hmm. bias, mm-hmm. and contemplative practice mm-hmm. into, 
from what appears to me from a distance, and I don't know anything about it, but I'm about to learn, mm-hmm. to be kind of a, quite a beautiful synthesis. So tell us what you're doing now and, and mm-hmm. how you got there. That's a really big question, so you can do whatever you want with it. But what are you up to, and how did it happen? <laughs> okay. Um so what am I up to? So I'm um, literally in New York here. Uh, just this weekend, I was um, very fortunate to be working with my friend and mentor, John Kabat-Zinn, who is, uh, as many of your listeners will know, um, you know, a, a leader in the movement to bring mindfulness meditation into the West and into the broader, uh, more secular world, having been a creator of mindfulness-based stress reduction many years ago and having uh, worked and established the Center for Mindfulness uh, at the University of Massachusetts. So John and I are, you know, friends and and collaborators now. He's also a mentor uh, and teacher of mine. Uh, But we were here um, to do a benefit at the New York Insight Meditation Center focused on mindfulness. uh, And, you know, the, the theme of it was, what good is mindfulness in a time of you know, madness uh, um, and uh, fear uh, and and what's the role of resolve in that, like in the face of madness and fear and how can mindfulness help. Uh, so we did a Friday night program, a couple hours uh, in dialogue between with each other and with the audience. And then we had a day long um, retreat. And so that I say that to say that's kind of a lot of what I, I do uh, in my copious spare time when I'm not a full-time law professor at the University of San Francisco, where I teach ordinary law classes like tort law and classes dealing with race and law, but also um, have brought uh, contemplative practices, mindfulness and compassion practices into into my work as a professor, um, more explicitly in the race class and in a class I co-created with several others, which is about mindful and loitering compassionate and mindfulness as a compassion and mindfulness as a way of developing one's professional identity and one the skillfulness that it takes to be a lawyer to be a wise counselor uh, in the midst of a conflict scenario um, so the class I teach on contemplative or mindful lawyering one place where I am bringing these practices specifically to bear on how we form lawyers for dealing uh, well uh, with the conflicts of the world and then the class that I really have created on um, looking at race and law with the support of mindfulness and compassion practices to help discern more effective ways of dealing with bias through um, through and in law um, and how to teach about that. So um, at, at USF, and then I, in my torts, torts class, my personal injury law class with first-year law students, a much more traditional course, um, Typically, I don't explicitly bring in mindfulness or compassion, but I do teach in a way, right, which creates the spaciousness around what we're doing, uh, the opportunity for my students to come in, sit in, center themselves and be grounded, um, remind themselves, disconnect from everything else and focus on the, you know, the copious material of tort law, which is what we, you know, and in the on the process of becoming a, a you know a law student my first year law students I meet them in the fall typically and so I'm part of the process by which that intense socialization uh, process for becoming a lawyer begins in law school and so there are very much more sort of subtle ways that I bring from mindfulness even into that class so my main job is to be a law professor but through at I've had the benefit of being able to use the work that I've done there to explore how mindfulness might be a support in that setting within education and higher education. And through that, I've developed a network of others who um, examine mindfulness in higher ed, whether it be in physics or economics, social work, law. Um, And that's been a very, very rich uh, and ongoing um, field of experimentation for me and field of, in some sense, now leadership, because I've served on the board of organizations that help support this nationally. Um, and uh, support the research around the effectiveness of mindfulness and meditation in science and in higher education. Um, so in one sense, that's, you know, my main main job. But I now also just really have been, you know, again, privileged to be able to teach 
mindfulness more generally with people like John, uh, Sharon Salzberg, Fleet Mall, who has brought mindfulness into the prison, prison and yeah, yeah. In, you know, my, uh, prison mindfulness mm-hmm. institute and community engaged mindfulness. I'm one of the teachers in his program. So I do a number of things now uh, to kind of bring mindfulness to bear in the really difficult spaces where we need deeper support, whether it be learning uh, a discipline that's challenging or practicing that kind of discipline, because I work with lawyers and prosecutors and judges sometimes as well, Um, or whether it be, you know, taking it out of this sort of institutional context into community where people are in conflict around race or around um, some incident with the police. So I've been a consultant with the San Francisco um, district attorney's office helping cultivate the capacity to respond to bring community together in the face of brutality and inc- incidents and the like. Um, yeah. And so right now I'm, I'm really um, exploring, you know, what it means to be this sort of person who's been a law professor for 20 years, um, who has along the way developed as a meditation teacher, a mindfulness teacher, um, with a deep kind of call or pull toward being of service in this moment, in this time where conflict is, 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 you know, and polarization is the order of the day and where we have lost our way, I think, in, in a certain sense in terms of our capacity f- to imagine ourselves in common community, um, and domestically and internationally. So um, after today, later this evening, I'll be getting on a plane to go to London, where I'll be speaking at Parliament and at Oxford. So these are um, more and more being drawn into kind of an international conversation about how these practices assist us in wise um, action and community building and policymaking in the face of the 21st century challenges that like, threatens. Like all the best guests, you have left me in a situation where I have about 15 things I want to ask <laughs> based on everything you just said. Much more of our conversation right after this quick break. Are you hiring? Join the over 3 million businesses that use Indeed.com for hiring. You can post a job in minutes and manage your candidates from an easy-to-use dashboard. Post your next job on the world's number one job site, Indeed.com. Are you feeling limitless? I don't think I've ever told this story publicly on the air anywhere, but I'll tell it now. Welcome to No Limits. I'm Rebecca Jarvis. Are you a psychiatrist? (laughs) No. Each week, we're taking an honest look at success and how to get there with the boldest, most influential women in the world. Jessica Alba. Ariana Huffington. Issa Rae. Barbara Corcoran. Robin Roberts. Welcome to No Limits. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. This is No Limits. One of the things you said was that you just did this thing with John Kabat-Zinn, who's a previous guest on this podcast, here at the New York Insight Center in in um, in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess the central question was something along, what's the point of mindfulness in these days of rage or, or yes. something, something like that? All right, yes. so what's the headline? What, what, what is the use of mindfulness? <laughs> Where'd you come to? That's a great question. Well, um, you know, John and I had an answer, and we you know, felt we were doing one thing. It'd be great. I'd love to hear what all of our, you know, hundreds of people who were there gathered <laughs> would say in response. Um, you know, I sh- I should say that in these times, you know, I'm, with my own daily mindfulness meditation practice, it has become much more a practice of loving kindness. You know, that practice by which we very consciously cultivate the capacity to sense into the kind of tightness or pain that the way in which we may in our bodies be feeling the distress of the day or the news or the tweet or whatever it is. Um, And kind of, again, create some spaciousness around that experience and soften the tendency of whatever the reactivity uh, that we might be experiencing in the moment. And from there, remind and rebody ourselves, myself, in the sense of my desire for well-being for myself and for others. So let me just, let me kind of, I just want to, just because mm-hmm. some people may not be familiar with 
the technical differences between between the two practices mm. that you described. So basic mindfulness meditation is uh, you feel your breath coming in and going out, mm-hmm. and then when you get distracted, you start again and again and again and again. Mm-hmm. Um, and the noticing you're distracted is many people think it's a failure, but actually that is the victory. That's mindfulness, yeah. Yes, that's where you see that you're nuts. <laughs> and it's cool. You don't have to be owned by well, the nuttiness. And, and you're human. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, love and kindness, which is often taught as a in in um, in tandem, in parallel mm-hmm. as a parallel practice, mm-hmm. is and I I often say it, it at first blush it seems irretrievably annoying, <laughs> uh, and it frankly is uh, when you first do it. It feels very affected and mm-hmm. and, yes. and syrupy, <laughs> yes. uh, where you sit and. System, you, you envision systematically specific people. Often, you classically, you start with yourself, then you move to a dear friend, then um, you move to. Um, I often I screw this order mm-hmm. up because I often insert my wife after <laughs> yeah, dear friend, but that's sure, not. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, no, you, you do a, be, a, a benefactor, benefactor and then a dear friend, mm-hmm. and then you do a neutral person, neutral a person. difficult person, mm-hmm. and then all beings. All beings. There's a way in which, and science bear, bears this out, that if you do this thing, even if it feels cloying, or as I often say, Valentine's Day with a gun to your, th- your head, um, uh, that it actually makes a difference. You, uh, faking it until you make it does work. Your your you, you, compassion is a muscle, and you're yes. working that muscle. Exactly, and yes. it feels weird, just like playing the piano for the first time or it might feel weird, but this exactly. does work. So anyway, you, I just wanted to be mm-hmm. clear with folks who don't may not know much about the specific practices you're talking about. But in answer to my question mm-hmm. of what do you what is the use of <laughs> mindfulness or meditation or whatever in the face of Madness, madness and of fear today, and, and fear and anger, anger, polarization, polarization. Mm. Your answer was or one the, answer. The is. beginning of your answer mm-hmm. before I cut you off and went on my soliloquy <laughs> no, was great. was um, was you're really increasingly turning to love and kindness. I am, and from that again, for me as a teacher practi- practitioner, person who takes mindfulness into the world, applying the research and the you know, the kind of deeper analysis of what it is that we're doing, but seeking to apply it to the world's problems. For me, it's always about groundedness in my own experience. So I'm not going to go out and sit with the people at New York Insight Meditation Center and say, here's how mindfulness can help you with polarization if I haven't been doing some regular daily work on that myself. And so I start with, well, what is it doing for me? Uh, How am I evolving and deepening and, you know, getting in the grittiness and muck of my own practice and life experience. Um, how is it that I'm, you know, my own in my own way, working with madness, fear, polarization through these practices? And I have just noticed, let's just say, over the last year or so, that loving kindness as a percentage of what I do has just been increased. Um, And I think the broader message from that is for me, you know, I do feel like so much, as I was saying before, of what we're dealing with is this sort of um, disconnectedness from the sense of common humanity and common wealth, um, that we are in this together, that we and, and I say disconnectedness as if there was a time when we were we had more of this. I don't know that we ever really did. I think in some places and in, in communities, um, we've had that. And um, and I, but I think in, if we're talking about a, a sense that the, in the in a, the American context, everybody matters and everybody's included. We talk about inclusivity, and we have had the. A kind of a, a value in our political and constitutional discourse for equality for all for a very long time. But did we practice equality for all? Of course not. We haven't historically. And and um, so in a very real sense, part of who, you know, what it means to be American is to be in this sort of conflicted state of having this rhetoric and soaring, inspiring kind of um, aspirational vision for who we are, but then you look at our actual practices on the ground. We've had segregation. We've had, you know, the male-female hierarchies that have played themselves out, and in in these and are showing up again today in in the sort of Me Too movement and and, and the evidence of ongoing ways in which um, women are still vulnerable more so than they should be in professional spaces. So, you know, it's reckoning with right the 
contradictions of being an American uh, in this time and place. They're, those contradictions are heightened right now in the particular political and cultural era. And people are feeling a lot of pain from that. I mean, so whether it be people who are feeling vulnerable to different immigration policies that are coming down and being enforced in uh, sometimes quite, I think, br- brutal ways, or people who are feeling vulnerable by health policy changes or tax policy changes or or people who saw the march in Charlottesville mm. uh, and other evidence where of you that, went to school. where I went to school and where I literally spent, you know, many beautiful hours and days walking the grounds right where those uh, statues were met with tiki torches and right literally on the the small avenue where protesters, uh, including Heather Heyer, were assaulted uh, and in her case murdered. So all of that, you know, was a very rich, very, very personal, and meaningful ground for me. But I think for all of us watching our America become a place where those kinds of visually visceral sort of um, powerful and, you know, painful, evocative of, of a kind of a history and a time and a kind of divisiveness. We have, most of us, you know, I'm 50 this year, 50 years old this year, you know, I've been blessed not to have seen a lot of that um, and yet to be to be you know brought up against the reality that this is still who we are is, I think, you know, has been quite painful for me and for lots of people. And so, again, for me, it's all of that feels like um, a highlighting of unfinished business around this broader American aspirational project of are we the people able to really include everyone? Um, are we able to continue uh, with a policy of encouraging immigration of the world's best and brightest? Are we able to continue this project by which we make more real the promises of the 14th Amendment of equality for a broader and broader um, broader and broader segments and, and, and percentages of the population uh, in this country? Are we able to be leaders on the world scene? that hold up these principles of human dignity and equality as, as uh, international human rights norms. These are, I think, um, profound, big questions for us right now. And at the core of the tension, I think, is this question of, like, do we value everyone? Can we increasingly see everyone as, as valuable, as worthy of compassion, of worthy of life, full life? Okay. And so mindfulness yeah. and loving kindness practices actually, I think, at the end of the day, help expand the capacity to imagine ourselves in common humanity and common human community. Well, that's just what I was going to ask, which is so given the <laughs> profundity of the issues and the scope of the issues and the seeming intractability of the issues that you just listed – what good does it do for you to sit there and, <laughs> and 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 cultivate feelings of loving kindness, compassion uh, um, toward uh, uh, whoever you decide to do it toward? Like, what what is what in the end is the benefit of that? You know, it starts with myself because in the midst of all of this, what is what is our normal tendency? It's to contract. It's to like figure out like, all right, how can I close ranks? Maybe I need to get with my own tribe. Maybe I too need a gun. Right. It's the fear reaction. So the first piece is how do I still my own fearful heart and kind of um, because for me, part one of the ways that I've survived the pain and, you know, the discriminations and actual abuse and different things that I've seen in my own life, you know, it's hard, some, I don't articulate it often, but I found myself trying to articulate it last night um, at last night's event. But the way in which the lesson for me in all of that is we end the pain now as humans. Like for the next, you know, I've suffered enough. I've seen enough suffering. Rather than try and put suffering out there in the world for anybody else and certainly uh, to minimize my own ongoing pain, I first need to stop, you know, stop the bloodletting. So... If I find myself in that space of fear, contractedness, 
you know, um, the sense of um, my own hyper vulnerability and the desire, the attraction, the pull towards othering and, um, you know, that hyper adversarial model that I can do. I've been in the military and the, and the law. When I feel myself being, you know, pu- pulled into defensiveness, into othering, um, into that dynamic, I can see the pain of that for me. You know, and I think part of what uh, I've decided for myself, it's like a decision. I don't want to be a part of the pain, uh, creating more pain in the world for myself or for others. And so it's that capacity with mindfulness to sense into how one is oneself, how we, how, what my own experience of, you know, feeling vulnerable, feeling afraid, what it does to me, how I start to then look at the world through the lens of that and to kind of notice that and consciously choose otherwise. And from there, then I can sort of, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm now at a place where I'm not reacting from a place of fear. I'm not reacting, you know, from a place of being triggered. I can then actually engage with other people in a way that minimizes the likelihood that we're just going to all, you know, organize ourselves around our fears and go out to find the next scapegoat or the target for our weaponry. Do you have any optimism that enough people, and I don't know what that number is, would adopt these practices so that actually we do see scale on a macro level as opposed to the micro level that you've described so well? Yeah. Well, I do. Partly that's because I, I do work with, you know, the the, pe- the great people around the world that I do. So everybody from John Kamazin to Norman Fisher, but also Norman, as you probably know, was one of the people who was instrumental in supporting the development of uh, Search Inside Yourself, Google's effort to bring mindfulness, you know, to a billion people, as, as Ming will say. Um, I just he recently joined the board of Search Inside Yourself. So because I'm working with people who actually are uh, taking it to scale and, um, you know, doing just this tiny bit to support that, um, I have some optimism. I'm not rose-colored about it. I, it's not going to happen over... You know, it may not happen in our lifetime, but um, nothing worth achieving happens at that, you know, in, in the very short term. I do think that's part of the, the, the sort of necessary maturation to how you deal well with conflict um, that we are being invited to do is to see the long term nature. So we didn't get to where we are overnight. We're not going to get out of where we are, the patterns and habits and conditions that we are struggling with. We don't get out of this overnight. But if we can see our way through today and tomorrow into an increasingly broad community in which we are practicing these things together today, broader tomorrow still, ideally, and so on, yes, I can optimistically imagine because I'm working with people who are helping me see that future and we're doing what we can every day, uh, a way f- that mo- a kind of a, a way in which we see this move from the personal, the micro, to the social, the collective, the macro. So because I'm a news reporter and we speak in sound bites, let me just see if I can summarize what your your answer to the question that that you were wrestling with at New York uh, Insight Center, which, by the way, is an excellent place and anybody who lives in the area, the New York area, it's a great place to go practice, uh, New York Insight uh, Meditation Meditation. Center. Mm -hmm. Um, The answer is, uh, what's the point of meditation in the age of polarization? It is, one... Uh, you will reduce your own suffering. Yes. Two, you will stop adding so much to the communal suffering, and you may not solve the problem, but it's important in cases like this to take the long view Mm -hmm. that certainly uh, you can do a little harm reduction and Mm -hmm. you can be taking part in what is a long-term movement towards sanity. Absolutely. And along the way, there will be markers of some success, I think. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. so remember like 10, 15 minutes ago, I said I was going to keep track of the questions I wanted to ask you. <laughs> yes. okay, that was one down. Um, here's the other one. Um, you talked about your work in using meditation to reduce bias. Yes. Um, is there any evidence that people who meditate are less racist, classist, sexist? Yes, but it's not as strong as I'd like it to be. It's mixed. There is evidence, for example, that uh, people sample uh, studies of samples of meditators um, show less, say, 
um, implicit bias using the implicit associations test at Harvard and others. So that's like a web thing. That's like a Mm -hmm. a little test you take on a computer to see what your implicit bias is. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard it criticized (laughs) as like – you could take it one day and it shows that you're like an intractable racist, and then another day that says you're like Mahatma Gandhi. So, do you test? Do you trust that test? I I, I think it's reliable um, uh, to a degree. I do. I mean, it, it's been um, shown to be at least in some measure um, uh, um, capable of helping us see some patterns. Now, at the same time, like any sort of skill or test uh, using uh, the online um, response times and the like, it's a little bit like a a video game. I think there's a way in which you can develop kind of skillfulness in doing what the test wants you to do that um, can help uh, disrupt it or counter its capacity to really get at what's happening, what's actually happening with you. So while I think it is helpful, I don't, necessarily rely on it uh, as, you know, as a, you know, in a biblical sense, you know, I think it's an indicator of something important. It's in that sense, worthy of our consideration, but at the same time, not over relying on it as a, you know, hard and fast indicator of where any one of us is. It's an indication. I find that many people who take it for the first time are in, you know, one way or another, find, learn, see something about themselves that they hadn't seen before. And whether over time they are able to work with it and figure out, you know, devote themselves to kind of get in the score that they want, right? And there are people who might manipulate it in that way. For many, many people, it's just a kind of a wake up to like a way in which they can see for themselves something undeniable about how their mind um, operates in a biased way. Uh, in ways that contradict what they would say explicitly about how their mind. So, so it like shows you pictures, and you have to have reactions. Yeah, like yes. It shows you pictures of human faces and different types of humans, different colors. Yes, and it, then it asks you to associate them with different terms. So uh, let's say you know uh, an African American face with you know the term uh, professor or good or honorable. Um, the delay with which many of us, right, find ourselves um, associating blackface with positive terms versus blackface with negative terms, criminal, um, dishonest, et cetera. There's a, we often are more quickly able to connect the keys uh, when we are asked to connect, um, you know, the kind of traditional stereotypical pairs, um, Latino with janitor as opposed to white face with janitor. A little bit harder time linking those two up together and, and so on and so forth. It's very easy to do the test. It only takes 10, 12 minutes. So if anybody's interested in listening to this to just see what it's like, it really is a very low threshold. Anytime you want, you can just do 10, 12 minutes or so of it and get a feel for yourself. Cause it's hard for me to explain it um, in a way that may make it, um, you know, sort of satisfying to a listener. Where would we find the test? So if you look up um, IAT, Implicit Associations Test, Harvard.edu. Um, Harvard, all these shabby schools, Harvard, Stanford, and together have kind of um, been a part of a collaboration to kind of um, make this test as reliable as possible and accessible as possible. And so there's an IAT, an implicit associations test for race, for gender, feelings about homelessness, age. So you can scroll through and see which tests you might be interested in and, you know, come back to it whenever you're ready. Um but yes, it is. It is a widely accessible. Millions and millions of people by now have taken it, and um, I think it is of some value. And so the research indicates that um, those who have had some simple mindfulness practice, as compared to people who have not, um, are often, you know, it indicate a reduction in bias simply by, uh, you know, by having some exposure to mindfulness. We, you know, it's not clear whether or not it simply reduces the how that happened or what's happening there is not clear. Like, are we, in fact, um, becoming more conscious of our bias and choosing as opposed to just reacting with from the place of bias in the automatic ways that we might if we don't have meditation practice under our belt? It's not entirely clear. Um, but the, and, and there's not a lot of studies that show this um correlation between meditation and reduction of bias as shown by the IIT. So it's a, you know, it's a finding in one research study that I've seen. Um, 
it needs to be replicated. It needs to be expanded, right? It's sort of a preliminary finding as far as I'm concerned in that sense. Um, we need a lot more research, in other words, to really be able to say mindfulness meditation makes you less racist or sexist. Um, I do think the, the indications are at least encouraging in a world where we're beset with these problems. So I've been a person out there saying, let's 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 explore whether mindfulness can support us in this. I will say also there's some research that shows that loving kindness practices minimize bias as well. The loving kindness practices that we spoke about earlier, um, that they help minimize certain kinds of bias against um, aged people who are aged, people who are uh, disfavored minorities. Um, homeless, right? There are different studies that have tried to see what kinds of practices in, may assist us in reducing bias against certain different types of groups. Again, not enough of that research yet. Um, and I will also say I've seen some unpublished studies that seem to indicate that what meditation can do is make you more aware of your bias, but not necessarily less biased. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's the thing. No, nothing's yeah. going to, I don't, yeah. I mean, I think there's a kind of a two step process, is just my personal experience. Is the first thing is to what mindfulness does is just more make you aware of all the ways in which we're you know if you look closely as Stephen Batchelor that my one mm-hmm. of my favorite writers has said if you look closely you will see a murderer and a rapist mm-hmm. you know that it, we all have that capacity <laughs> mm-hmm. it's in our mind somewhere yeah. you know the um, so it, you you see your homicidal urges <laughs> you see your your racist urges you exactly. see them but you're just better at like. Um, letting them pass as as and as opposed to be as opposed to being owned by them. Mm-hmm. But the second part of that, at least in my experience and my understanding of of Buddhist theory, is that once you stop feeding blindly, feeding those urges and impulses and thoughts, actually you can start deconditioning them so they are less likely to arise. Mm-hmm. So I, I mean, it makes sense to me based on my personal practice and my understanding mm-hmm. of the practice mm-hmm. that. The, both of these practices, med- mindfulness meditation and loving kindness, could reduce uh, both bias, but also the, the the fruit of bias, which is racism mm-hmm. or or feminine uh, mm-hmm. or, uh, or sexism, or, sexism mm-hmm. or classism. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, but let me ask you this: uh, from a crass standpoint, mm-hmm. most of my questions are crass. <laughs> um, I'm a TV reporter. I would love to do a story at some point about ways in which these practices are being used. To reduce bias, like what's right. the coolest stuff that's going on? Like, how, uh, what are you doing? What What is anybody else doing that would be an interesting thing to take a picture of? Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, I'm going to go and talk to the College of Policing in London, and part that is going to, I hope, um, part of the reason why they are interested in talking to me is because they haven't really explored, they haven't done the research yet, um, but they're interested in whether or not these practices can help. Police in the UK be less biased. Um, we in the United States, we have police officers and, and people in law enforcement who are similarly interested in these practices, who are being engaged in training around these practices. There is uh, so there are there are there are definitely places and populations where mindfulness, compassion practices and mindfulness and compassion practices are being introduced with a view towards determining whether or not they can assist in minimizing bias. You know the work of Anurag Gupta, right? So there are yeah. lots of, there are a number of people Pri- who are working on Prior guests on this podcast. Yes, exactly. Gupta, exactly. Yes, I just yes. saw him last night too. Yeah. Um, so there are no, you know, there's, some of us are working on it and, but it's at the, an early enough stage that I think, you know, uh, the findings to confirm exactly what works and what works for what populations are, are to come. But, you know, cool things to look at right now are just the different, ways that we're bring, bringing these practices into tr- into diversity-related work. I mean, that's actually an area where I'm, you know, more and more human resources officers um, in companies, in higher institutions of higher education, um, you know, government ent- entities, um, a range of institutions who have mission-oriented and public responsibilities to, to kind of serve everybody are... Are, are sort of taking up these practices, whether and to what extent they will show, you know, actually prove to minimize bias is something that, again, is a work in progress. I think it's, again, we do need to talk about this more. We do need to incentivize the research community to look at mindfulness and compassion practice with this kind of res- these kinds of research questions in mind. Because really what's been happening is, you know, there's been an explosion of different types of research around this. But most of it has been very much about like personal effectiveness and 
you know, all the great things that um, have gotten us all talking about mindfulness because we can see a pathway from like our own chaotic mindlessness to a more uh, effective, productive way of being with our own messiness and our own mess. So a lot of the research has just been about just very personal productivity, um, focus, um, uh, health consequences and health benefits, right? Aging more effectively, right? It's like all arrayed around how can I make the most of my own personal life? These, uh, re- the research that would bear out these more public, you know, pro social goals. Um, is is sort of in a set is like the uh, the current phase of mindfulness research is starting to look at this, but it has not been what motivated the field. So people like me who are not just practitioners and you know advocates, but in um, you know community with researchers, I'm a, I'm engaged with the Mind and Life Institute as well, um, which does a lot of research around mindfulness. You know, part of what I why I'm in, engaged as a volunteer and a steering committee media, you know member there, advising the board of directors and the staff there, is to help be a part of, you know, the process by which PhD students, neuroscientists are seeing this is a place where they can also have an impact, um, inspiring them to see these sort of um, social applications of these practices as really important right now. So that's kind of where we are and. So this summer at the Garrison Institute in uh, Garrison, New York, uh, not too far from here, uh, the Mind and Life Institute, you know, we regularly host a uh, summer research institute where, again, these, you know, um, PhDs and postdocs who are just kind of, you know, in the early stages of building their careers are brought together for a week with um, more or less uh, senior um scientists, uh, teachers, and people who are applying these practices in the world like me. And we, we are encouraging and helping form the kind of next generation of researchers. And so for the last several years, a number of us have been really trying, doing the best we can to help seed amongst the research, you know, in that population, uh, a desire to, to kind of look at the way these practices actually do benefit individuals, but have these broader social, whether it be education, whether it be, you know, education policy, whether it be policing policy, health care, right? Because we're seeing more and more that um, mindfulness might be seen as a public health intervention. The research around that is, 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 is a warning, right? It's, it's really in the early stages. But I do think there, there are stories to be told about how this will develop. Um, we're we've we, I've, I've held you for a long time. I'm sensitive to your time. I know you got to catch a plane sometime soon. Um, uh, last question is: Is there anything I should ask you but didn't? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, okay. One one thing that I have been talking a lot about is just frankly the whiteness of the field, right? So, as an African American woman, the whiteness and the um, to some extent the the, the male orientation, maleness too, but really that um, what we call mindfulness in America has been created, of course, by a certain wonderful group of people, my friends and teachers, uh, who almost all white, almost all white, almost all Jewish, yeah, and so and they taught their friends and so on and so on. So I do think that has um, had some, you know, we're, we're living with the implications of that right now. We go to an event like at New York. Insight Meditation Center, which is one of the more diverse meditation centers in the country. And still, um, we find disproportionately the population who's there, the research population that I just spoke about, um, it's still arrayed around, you know, white experience. Um, And, um, you know, more and more, it's just apparent that if we're going to survive as a species, Uh, We have to expand these practices. This one billion uh, meditators image that that Ming and others that search inside yourself at Google, not to plug them too much, that particular organization. Um, This this is a plug friendly zone, by the way. Okay. Well, they're not at Google. I should make that clear. It's now a spinoff. But, um, you know, the idea that we might have meditators around the world depends for its viability on our finding a way to make these practices much more accessible to the people like my family still back in North Carolina who think of all of this as a little bit crazy still. The people, you know, in Southern California who, you know, recent immigrants who, um, you know, English language learners who 
haven't yet found a lot of places where they could safely come and explore meditation. We have to be thinking about that if we're going to go forward and really see the benefits that I imagine we can see um, for the application of these practices in the I, world. I, think I strongly agree, and I say that as a white, half-Jewish man. So, <laughs> I mean, as part of the sort of overrepresented group. <laughs> yeah. But I, I would say... I think the way this is going to happen is that is to and where I think maybe somebody like me can can help is to elevate voices that will speak to these groups because I think mm. I have limited reach yes. by dint of the package yeah. I come in right we and, all do we all do right that's the that's the insight yes but I happen to have a platform yes. so like I can put people on this platform or on mm -hmm. the ten percent happier app yeah. who can reach groups that I might not be able to yeah. reach and you have been doing that so I, I thank you for that yeah well it's a kind of a no-brainer you know mm -hmm. and you know what maybe a little bit of, uh, maybe I wouldn't have done this before Sharon Salzberg forced me to do so much love and kindness meditation yes. who knows <laughs> um, but yeah it's a, I find I consider it to be one of the most fun parts of the job but you know hey I have still plenty of bias left we and there's all all, a lot of work left to be done. We all do. And so, um, you know, again, thank you for this conversation, for the work that you were doing, right, thank to, you. you know, really help, again, expand just really knowledge about what's happening with mindfulness, um, a expand the sort of sense of that it is it is accessible to, to all of us and might be of benefit, right? Just, let's just say that. It might be of benefit to anybody willing to explore. It's almost certainly of benefit, and it is <laughs> exactly. a birthright of all of us, not yeah. just something that's available to yeah. all of us. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for coming on this thank podcast. You. We've been trying to get you on here for a long yeah. time, so it's really nice to finally Thank you. I'm so out. glad I was able to be here with you, Dan. Okay, that does it for another edition of the 10% Happier Podcast. If you liked it, please take a minute to subscribe, rate us. Also, if you want to suggest topics you think we should cover or guests that we should bring in, hit me up on Twitter, at Dan B. Harris. Importantly, I want to thank uh, the people who produce this podcast, Lauren Efron, Josh Cohan, and the rest of the folks here at ABC who helped make this thing possible. We have tons of other podcasts. You can check them out at abcnewspodcasts.com. I'll talk to you next Wednesday.